This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here and welcome back to the channel. I have another patient case prepared to review with all of you, so let's go ahead and get started. So for this patient, I have five questions to go along with the case. So first, let's introduce the patient. We have an eight-year-old male and his mother is coming to the appointment with him and says he's ready to have his tooth filled today. The patient has autism, epilepsy, and is taking risperidone. He weighs 25 kilograms, has some heavy plaque accumulation, and primary caries on three teeth, number A, J, and 30. So go ahead, pause the video, read through this question, and then we'll go over it together. Okay, so the patient is scheduled to have tooth number 30 restored today. What's the maximum amount of carpules of 2% lidocaine without epinephrine that can be safely administered to the patient? So as is the case for most medications for children, the proper dose is adjusted based on their body weight. And it turns out that lidocaine, and most local anesthetics for that matter, are based on the body weight for both children and adults. The correct dosing depends on the specific anesthetic agent and if there's vasoconstrictor or not. In this case, there's not. So the limit for lidocaine without epinephrine is 4.4 milligrams per kilogram. Now, some sources actually say 4.5, but let's stick with 4.4. That's the one that I like to use. And if the lidocaine has vasoconstrictor, has epinephrine, let's say, as part of the formulation, the limit is a bit higher at 7 milligrams per kilogram. That's not relevant for this question, but I just wanted to bring it up for you. So with the 4.4 milligram per kilogram guideline for lidocaine, that means we can go up to 110 milligrams for this 25 kilogram patient. How I did that was just you take that 4.4 and you multiply by the patient's weight in kilograms and you get 110 milligrams. So 4 times 25 is 100 and then 0.4 times 25 is just 100 with one less zero. So that's 10. You add the 100 and the 10 to get 110. The next clue that we have is this 2% number. So that means there's 20 milligrams for every one milliliter of solution. That's just what 2% means. 20 milligrams per one milliliter. If it was 1%, it would be 10 milligrams per every one milliliter and so on. Since the standard carpule in the US contains 1.8 milliliters of liquid, that means there is 36 milligrams of lidocaine per carpule. So all we did there was we took one, multiplied by 1.8, took 20, multiplied by 1.8. So this is our magic number, 36 milligrams of lidocaine for a 2% lidocaine carpule. I actually, in our local anesthetics video, just tell you to memorize that number because it makes all this calculation here kind of not needed. So with that 36 milligram number, now we just have to figure out how many carpules or how many 36 milligrams can we fit without going over this 110 limit. So let's erase all of this stuff because we don't need it anymore. So one times 36 milligrams is 36. That's too low for our 110 limit. We can handle more carpules than just one. How about two times 36? That's going to be 72. Still a little low. Let's see if we can fit one more. Three times 36 is 108. And that's just under our limit of 110. So that one looks really, really good. And just for kicks, we'll do four times 36, which is 100 and 44. So that's over our limit and too high. So the best answer 
maximum amount of carpules that can be safely administered to the patient underneath that limit of 110 based on their weight is going to be answer choice C. Okay, question number two. Go ahead and pause the video, think through the question, and then we'll go over it together. All right, in the event of a seizure episode, what is the first step you should take? So for a seizure in a dental setting, there are a few things that you should do to help minimize injury to the patient and some things you shouldn't do. So let's go through each of these answer choices one at a time. So answer choice A is restrain the patient from seizing to protect them from injury. Well, of course we wanna protect them from injury, but restraining the patient is not the way to do that. You should absolutely not restrain the patient from seizing. This can cause injury to you and the patient because the patient can't control their movements. It could result in bruising, a dislocated shoulder, and a whole host of other potential issues. For option choice C, supplemental oxygen might be helpful for a patient, but it's not the first thing you should do. That can come a bit later. Again, we're looking for the first step in this emergency situation. For answer choice D, if the seizure lasts longer than five minutes, it would be a good time at that point to administer midazolam or another appropriate emergency anti-epileptic drug or you could contact emergency services at this point if you don't have access to the proper medication. But again, this isn't the first thing you should do. This would be after five minutes. So going back to answer choice B, removing instruments from the immediate area that can be sharp and dangerous is the first thing you should do for the patient to help limit their injury. Then if they're sitting in the dental chair, you would put that chair as low as possible to the ground or carefully place the patient on the floor and keep their head protected. Not restrain them, but keep them protected from potentially knocking into something if at all possible. So the best answer here is B. Question number three, go ahead and pause the video, read through the question, and then we'll go over it together. What is the best strategy to implement for this child if he refuses to cooperate during the appointment? Well, we talked about it at the beginning. This patient has autism, which means behavior may be a bit more challenging to manage. Not necessarily, but it is a possibility. Things like temper tantrums, hyperactivity, a short attention span, and a tendency for aggressive behaviors are common features in these patients. Again, not all of them, but many. So with that in mind, what should we implement here? Well, general anesthesia, which is drug-induced loss of consciousness, and deep sedation, which is a drug-induced state of semi-consciousness, are both too aggressive of a management strategy, especially from the first bout of uncooperative behavior for a simple operative procedure. Remember, we're just filling tooth number 30 here. Deferring the appointment to another day is also not the best first option. It would be best to start with a conservative method like tell, show, do. Tell the patient what you'll do, show them in a safe, controlled environment, and then do it. It helps build rapport and communicate effectively. And if that doesn't work, then you might consider something like nitrous oxide inhalation or conscious sedation with a benzodiazepine to help complete the restoration, but certainly not jumping straight into deep sedation or general anesthesia. Or let's say this were a recall exam and the patient was uncooperative after this tell show do and some other conservative management techniques. Then at that point, I would defer the appointment to another day if it's not an urgent situation or procedure. So the best choice for this scenario is D. Question number four. Go ahead, pause the video, think through the question, and then we'll go over it together. At the conclusion of the appointment, 
the parent expresses concern about using fluoride varnish for her child's teeth. What would be the best level of evidence to support the claim that fluoride is beneficial for tooth health? Well, this is jumping into the evidence-based dentistry realm, and the hierarchy of evidence is often depicted as a pyramid with the lowest level of evidence at the bottom, usually animal studies and expert opinions, and it goes all the way up to the highest level of evidence at the top of the pyramid, which is the systematic review, which takes multiple papers on a similar topic, systematically reviews them, and compares and contrasts their results. So with that in mind, I do like answer choices A and B here, because they both mention systematic reviews. For fun, let's look at C. Randomized controlled trials are high-level studies because the randomization process helps control for a lot of potential biases, but it's still only one study at the end of the day, probably with a smaller sample size or some limitations in design. The double-blind study is a higher-level version of a randomized controlled trial where both the participants and the researchers are blind to what group the participants have been randomized to. So it's a great design, but it's still only one study by itself with one sample. So the question then becomes, what's the difference between A and B, this meta-analysis? And what is a meta-analysis? Well, that combines the results of multiple studies in a quantitative way. So let's just say a bunch of clinical studies measured caries incidence in patients receiving regular fluoride varnish and patients receiving a placebo varnish. You would take the same measurement from all the studies, their standard error, their confidence intervals, and then combine everything to effectively increase your sample size and see what the literature collectively tells you as some sort of statistic or number. And for that reason, it's the highest level of evidence available. If you can get a systematic review with that meta-analysis, you're in really, really good shape for getting a nice high quality answer. So the best answer for this question is going to be B. All right, and the last question of this case set. So go ahead and pause the video, think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. So the patient's mom calls your office the following day and sends you this picture of her child. What's the most likely explanation for this lip swelling? So we're presuming the patient has gone through that filling, that operative procedure. They were able to cooperate. And now we get this phone call the next day. Now, that's a fairly large swelling and a reasonable thing to be concerned about from the mother's point of view. In the context of this case, though, we know local anesthetic was likely delivered, that lidocaine that we calculated in the first question, via an inferior alveolar nerve block for the patient's right side for caries removal of tooth number 30. Again, going back to the information presented in the first question. So with all of that background, let's go through the answers. An allergy to local anesthetic is rare but possible and it would be a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. So you would get an immediate response, probably a few minutes after, right in the dental chair at least, not on the following day. So that alone kind of rules that answer choice out. And also, with the allergy, likely the whole lips would be swollen, not just this right side of the lower lip. So answer A is out. An overdose comes with a whole host of symptoms that would also be experienced probably during the appointment. You'd have things like hypotension, maybe some convulsions, some respiratory depression, much more serious issues that would be noticeable. So answer B is also out. I'm gonna skip down for D. Post-operative infection doesn't really make sense either unless the lip itself were somehow infected. That seems like a very low likelihood. So I'm going to rule D out as well. And this turns out is just an instance of lip and possibly cheek biting. After the procedure, while the patient was still numb, 
he accidentally was chewing on his lip, causing it to swell up from the repeated iatrogenic trauma. So the best answer of these four, and the most likely explanation for the lip swelling, is going to be lip biting answer choice C. So that's it for this case set. I hope you found it helpful reviewing everything from evidence-based dentistry to some local anesthetic calculations. Let me know in the comments how you did, how many questions you got right, and if you'd like to see more of these patient cases. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.